Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. Matthew chapter 18 is where we're heading this morning. Matthew chapter number 18. We're going to continue today with the series on the wonder of forgiveness. Last week we talked about the forgiveness of Christ and undoubtedly the greatest experience that you and I have had in our relationship with Jesus Christ has been the forgiveness of our sin. It is the wonder of forgiveness that God knowing us like he does and friend do not underestimate the fact God knows us. The Bible says he knows the thoughts that we have. He knows the motive in our hearts. He knows the word on our tongue before we even speak it. God says that he knew us before we were born, when we were yet in our mother's womb. He knows everything about you and I. And knowing us like he does, in the midst of that, yet he would extend his miracle of forgiveness into our lives. You know, forgiveness is one of those topics that we've heard about all of our lives since childhood. It is the principle of being forgiven and extending forgiveness of others. And, you know, if you were to ask most professing believers today what forgiveness means, uh, the majority of them could tell you exactly what forgiveness means. They could tell you what God can do in your life through forgiveness. And then they could tell you as well what our responsibility is in this issue of forgiveness So forgiveness really is something that we know a lot about uh, as believers in Christ. Now John 13, uh, before we get to our text, John 13 verse 17 says, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. How many of y'all want to be blessed this morning? Now about four of you. How many of y'all want to be blessed this morning? Amen, that's what I thought. He says, Now that you know these things... You'll be blessed if you do them. This morning we're going to look at forgiveness the way that God does and what he expects of us in this area of forgiveness. You know, last week as we talked about the wonder of his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy, uh, I have to tell you I am overwhelmed at his mercy in my life. The times I have never deserved him to be merciful to me and yet he's reached out in mercy. The times I did not deserve his grace, and yet in an unmerited way, he gave me his powerful grace. And the Bible teaches us a principle that says, to whom much is given, much will be required. It is an incredible debt that has been relieved in our lives at the forgiveness of our sin. But friend, that that wonderful gift then is to not only flow into our lives, but that gift is to flow out of our lives. The truth is we find that Jesus has a lot to say about forgiveness. Mark chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Luke 6 and 37, forgive and you will be forgiven. Matthew 6 and verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You really could nearly reword that prayer in this way, Lord, forgive me the way I have forgiven others. Treat me with the same mercy that I have given to others. Extend the same grace in my life that I have extended into the lives of others. The principles of Christ's message is what we're looking at. Last week we looked at forgiveness in our relationship between us and God. Today we're going to carry that a little bit farther and look at our forgiveness of others and how that impacts our relationship with the Heavenly Father. Matthew chapter 18 is where we're going and what I'd like to ask you to do, just leave your Bible open or your uh, electronic device of choice, just leave it open and we're going to walk through this passage from chapter Uh, 18 verses 21 to 35. We're going to walk through all of that together and see what the Lord has to say to us this morning. Verse number 21, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? 
up to seven times. Now we know from history that the Pharisees believed that if you forgave someone three times that you were a person of great mercy and great uh, extending, you extended grace and mercy in a great measure. Peter, knowing that, knowing what the Pharisees believe, Peter says to Jesus, when someone sins against me, how many times should I forgive them? He says, up to seven times. Peter thinking, you know, I'm really, I'm not going to kind of just meet the standard. I'm going to, I'm here with Jesus. I'm going to kind of go a cut above and, and I'm really, I'm going to try to impress Jesus with how uh, good of a person I am. So we find Jesus gives a response. Now, here's, here's the problem, folks. Here's what we see in Peter's question. Peter is implying that there's going to come a time in my life, Peter's life, my life, your life. Peter said there's going to come a time in our life when we're going to choose not to extend forgiveness to somebody. He says, how many times should I forgive? Up to seven? You know, you, you may be the lucky one day. You were number seven. Tomorrow, everybody else is in trouble. And you're in trouble tomorrow. <laughs> He's giving the principle and the thought that there comes a time when we'll say enough is enough. If I continue to extend forgiveness, people will take advantage of me and I'll just keep giving out grace. So he implies the thought that there's a time when forgiveness will not be extended. Jesus responded. Let me tell you, Jesus always knows the right words to respond. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Times. Now, some of your translations may say 70 times 7, 490 times. The, the point that Jesus is making here is not that you and I kind of keep our little uh, memo pad in the back pocket and every time we extend forgiveness, we make a mark and we keep track of, okay, Carol, you're on uh, number 49 today. And keep that in mind, Carol, I've been merciful to you 49 times. Now, you, you know, you're pushing here a little bit. The point is he's trying to imply is that we don't keep track. We're not keeping track of this. Aren't you glad God hasn't kept track of it with you? Man, I'm so glad he hasn't kept track because let me tell you, I'd have given him plenty of reasons to throw me out a long time ago. But he continues to extend mercy. He's teaching Peter you can't put a limit on forgiveness. Verse 23. Jesus begins to teach them, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, can you imagine that? 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. The point that Jesus is making here is that this is a, an amount that is unpayable. If you worked your entire life and you worked 24 7, Every day of your life, never sleeping, never stopping for a break, but the entirety of your life, you would never come close to paying this kind of an amount. This was an unpayable debt. It was bigger than the man's ability to render back. Friend, what you and I owe to God could never have been paid. I believe that if uh, forgiveness is an important issue with God because he knows the value of the price that was paid to rescue you and me from our sins. He knows what it cost. Look at verse 25. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. He could not pay. Many people have done many things to you. They've done things to the people you love. And the truth is they cannot pay. There's no possible way for them to repair the damage that has been done. They cannot replace the peace of mind that has been taken. They cannot heal in your life what has been injured. There is no payment you can get from them, no revenge you can impose that can pay the price. There's nothing that can be done short of grace. 
since he could not pay, the scripture says, the master ordered that he and his family and all that he had be sold until the debt could be paid, which we know would never have happened. Look at verse 26. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything, which was impossible. It was never going to happen. This man could not have lived long enough to pay it all back. It has been said, the person who sins against us, wrongs us, hurts us, never actually takes into account what they will owe us for their wrong. The person who needs to be forgiven never accurately calculates what they will owe. I think that would be true of us in regard to God. Verse 27, the servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. There's something powerful here that you and I can't overlook. He didn't give stipulations. He didn't remind him of how unworthy of a servant that he was. He didn't say, okay, listen, what we'll do, buddy, is we'll let you pay 25% and we'll write off the rest. The Bible says he took pity on him. What does that mean? He had compassion on him. His heart was moved because, why? Because of his circumstances. And the Bible says he canceled the debt and let him go. It wasn't a hard thing. It wasn't something this man had to earn or merit. He said, I have pity and mercy and compassion on you. I'm canceling the debt. Going home. Isn't that the way Christ did us? I'm glad I didn't have to wait. I'm glad he didn't say, Jerry, you can work out 25% of the sin and I'll forgive the rest of it. I'm glad he didn't say, you work for a few years in the church, and maybe if you earn enough good things, and if you do enough good things, then maybe I'll write it off. But no, in the moment, he had mercy on me when I didn't deserve mercy. He had grace on me when I didn't deserve grace. And he said, I'll forgive you, and I'll cleanse you. Now you can go free. Your debt is canceled. It's the lesson now that Jesus teaches But it's the lesson that he enacts. Look at verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded of him. The treasure of scriptural knowledge describes The amount of money in this way, a hundred silver coins, would not have been one six hundred thousandth of a part of the ten thousand bags of gold that he owed. It was nothing in comparison. Jesus makes his point clear here. The problem is that we lose sight of what we really owed. We struggle with forgiveness because we don't fully grasp the reality of how indebted to God we've really been. Look at verse 29. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I'll pay it back. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like the words of verse 26. The very same words that were said to the king about a debt that could not be paid now are the very same words being spoken about a debt that could be paid. Verses 30 and 31. But he refused. You'll notice there's a choice. Forgiveness is about a choice. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. 
I canceled all of that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. The master responded by saying, you wicked servant. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? It's a rhetorical question that he's asking. Of course, the answer is yes. But I chose not to do it. Remember the words of Jesus in John 13 we read earlier. Now that you know these things... Blessed are you if you do them. I knew it, but I didn't do it. I don't know if there are any more sobering passages of Scripture than this one when Jesus, referring to his Father, says, This is how my Heavenly Father will treat you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. The word says this man was delivered to the jailers to be tortured until his debt could be paid, which we know would never have happened. So if we know these things, if we know we are to forgive as we have been forgiven, if we know these things, then why don't we forgive? I would submit to you that we don't forgive because we don't often correlate the forgiveness of someone else with our ability to be forgiven by God. We have no idea. We bypass in the moment of our grief, in the moment of our anger, in the moment of our hurt, in the moment of our offense. And as we carry that around in life, we do not correlate. We correlate that between that's between me and you. And we try to separate me and you from me and God. But friend, you can't separate me and you and me and God. You can't be in good relationship with God and be in bad relationship with everybody else. You can't be loving to God and be hateful to everybody else and expect it to work. It won't work. Secondly, we make the rationalization for our lack of forgiveness. Peter was trying to do it with Jesus. He was saying to Christ, I'll go this far and no more. What Peter was doing was looking for a loophole. So many times we do the same. It's a thought that surely there are some people I don't have to forgive. It's as though we think our case is different from everyone else's. Jesus says there are no loopholes, there are no exceptions, we're all the same. When someone injures us, we're always looking for a way out, an excuse. This backpack, I want it to represent this morning offenses and hurts that have occurred in your life. Because the truth is, every one of us in here, no one, no one has lived life, unless you're maybe that little baby that just they brought into church today, everybody else has been offended and hurt by someone. Someone said a word to you, someone uh, lived an action, they committed a crime against you, uh, they violated your life, um, they've done things that have caused hurt, every one of us in this room have had that. This backpack represents those hurts. Often what happens in life is we take those uh, things that we put into our life, and for the rest of our lives, we carry it around everywhere we go. Everything we do, it's there. Five rationalizations for continuing to carry this load on your back for the rest of your life. Number one is this. People say, I can't forgive because it's too big. My friend, all the more reason to get rid of it. 
If it's too big for you to forgive, then it's way too big for you to carry around on your shoulders. It's way too big for you to carry it in your life and keep it in your life. It's way too big for you to continue day after day after day to bear that thing in your life. Because what it'll do, it'll rob you. It'll take your peace away. If it's so big, friend, it will put you in a prison for all the days of your life. Second rationalization people make is this, time will heal. I'm going to let some time pass and eventually it'll go away. I'm not the oldest person in this room, but I've lived long enough to find out that time doesn't heal anything. I had Colton this week. He, uh, he asked me, he said, uh, have you ever put up chain link fence? I said, yes, yes, I have. And I said, uh, we were sitting at lunch. I said, see my hand right there? I said, you see that scar in an L shape? That came from putting up chain link fence. Years ago, probably when Colton was toddling around, <laughs> Tom Wright and I were putting up a fence, and I got too carried away driving the post in, and somehow my hand ended up between the post and the driver. Yeah, it didn't work out real well. I remember that day. I remember going to the clinic, and I remember the doctor not numbing it and digging around, and I remember looking at Tom going, is he ever going to stop? You see, it was pain. Now, that's been years ago. There's still the reminder. We think, well... I'll just let some time go by, and if I avoid them and if I avoid the situation, it'll all be okay. But listen, one of these days, friend, you're going to run into them at Walmart. It's just the truth. Or, you know, somebody's going to call, uh, let's get everybody together that used to be in that group. And you haven't done that in 25 years, and they're going to do it now. And you're going to have to go see them. And here's what you find is when you see them the first time, whew, it rushes back. And immediately you begin to relive the scenario and the situation. The third rationalization we make is this. I will forgive when they say they're sorry. I'll lay it down when they come and they make things right with me. But until then, I'm going to continue to carry this around. I'm going to continue. I'm, I'm going to just be honest with you. Sometimes we almost celebrate what we're carrying around. I'm just going to keep carrying this thing around. I'm going to keep bearing the burden. I'm going to keep weighing myself down with this because I'm waiting for the day when they're going to come and they're going to say, I'm sorry. And they're going to come and they're going to grovel at my feet and they're going to talk about how terrible they were and how wicked they were and how they're nothing better than a worm. <laughs> hey, you're laughing, but you felt that way before, didn't you? <laughs> we all have, haven't we? So I'm going to keep this here until they come. Listen, they're not coming. If you, like me, have lived long enough, you'll find out the majority of the times people have offended you, man, you might get one or two in a lifetime that'll come back and say, you know what, I was sorry, I was wrong. What I did was wrong. I'm a worm. <laughs> Forgive me. Truth is, if you're waiting on them to come, Friend, they're not coming back. The fourth rationalization we make is this. I can't forgive if I can't forget it. If we still can remember it, we say, I can't forgive them. I told you that all those years ago when Colton was a toddler, now he works here. I cut my hand. I remember it. You know what's amazing? It's been long enough ago. That doctor died a few years ago. And I'm still here complaining about the work he did on my hand. <laughs> I'm never, I'm never going to be able to forget what's happened. Listen to me. 
You say, I can't forgive them because I can't forget it. You're never going to be able to forgive them. And you're never going to be able to forget the situation until you start forgiving them. It won't go away until you release them. It's going to still be on your back day in and day out until you release them. The fifth rationalization is this. If I forgive them, they'll just do it again. Friend, you and I are not responsible for what others do. We are only accountable for what we do. That's between them and God. This is our part between us and God. Yep. Kind of choose to carry it around. It came off my belt. (laughs) The truth is, the fallout of unforgiveness is more than you and I can imagine. The fallout of unforgiveness touches everyone in our path. Unforgiveness cuts a path like a storm in your life, leaving only broken pieces in its path. I don't know about you guys, but last night at our house, the wind blew. Man, the wind blew. And it rained, and the wind blew, and the wind, you know, it just kept going and kept going and kept going. And Paul and I pulled up to the church this morning. The wind had stopped. The rain had stopped. But all along the building, there was pieces of what the storm had blown. There was a residual left over. It was broken pieces, little pieces of limbs and leaves and all kinds of things that the wind had blown. Unforgiveness does that in our life. It leaves a path of broken pieces. Think about that servant in our story. He left the king's presence so free of all of his death, and he went out and he made things really bad really fast. He wanted the forgiveness of the king, but he refused to extend it to someone else. Look at the condition of the servant. Look there in verse 28. When the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins and he grabbed him and began to choke him. And he said, pay back what you owe me. This shows us the servant's heart. Though he had received mercy, his heart had not yet been changed. He was not impacted by the forgiveness he had received for his conduct toward his fellow servant was proof of it. Imagine for a moment, you're walking down the sidewalk. Someone bursts out of a building and says, you know, not calmly, hey, you owe me five bucks. The Bible says he came out and grabbed him. And not only did he grab him, the Bible says he began to choke him. Give me back those few coins that you owe me. Look at the reputation of his life. Verse 29. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. You know, friends, we think we can carry unforgiveness and God is none the wiser. But unforgiveness will affect every life around you. You say, well, it's, it's kind of my, you know, it's kind of like the backpack. It's my thing to, to carry. It's my thing to, to move around. Listen, everybody in your life is going to be affected. Parents, the children between you two will be affected. Children, the parents between you two will be affected. Employee. And the boss at work, the other employees between you and the boss will be affected. How many conversations happen around the water cooler about the boss? Unforgiveness encompasses all the people between you and that other person. It's the people, it's the people who know that we claim to be followers of Christ and they're watching our lives. Next, you see the humiliation that comes when the servant, again, has to stand before the king. This time, he has nothing to say. Imagine that. 
because there's nothing to say. Knowing what you and I know about the gospel, knowing what you and I know today about the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in our lives, knowing today what we know about the many things that Jesus has forgiven us of that nobody else in this world even knows about. Knowing all those things, how one day do you think you and I'll stand before him and describe to him why we weren't able to forgive someone else? What might we say? What are you going to tell Christ on that day? What words do you think you can speak that will allow him to let you slide on in? I fear, just like this other servant, it'll be a quiet room. So how then does God view unforgiveness? Notice last of all, the consequences of unforgiveness are lasting. Verse 34, in anger, the master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. You'll notice that this is a response to the choice made by the servant. Verse 35, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. Listen, friends, God's word is true. God doesn't need the popular opinions of commentators or editors or anyone in the world to say what he wants to say. God's word is true and he means what he says. This is not a mistake in the rendering of this scripture. This is not someone's opinion. This is the word of truth for each of us and how we're to act in these circumstances. Matthew 6 and verse 14 for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I have to tell you this next passage, James 2 and 13, is probably one of the scariest. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. You can't hardly read that without having to take a deep swallow. Judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. You see, grace is getting what we don't deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. When we choose to give mercy, we choose to not give them what they deserve. And judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Matthew 5 and 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Unforgiveness, friend, is a cancer of the soul. You and I are most like Jesus Christ when we forgive. Forgiveness is the decision that you and I make to release a person from the obligation that occurred when they injured us. I choose to release you. Friend, if you and I are going to become champions in Jesus Christ, this is one of the truths we got to get settled. If we're going to grow in our walk with Christ and become everything that he's intended for us to be and created us to be, we're going to have to deal with this issue in our life. Because, listen, the truth is, we've all been offended. We've all been hurt. The truth is, sometimes we think, well, you don't know my story. Well, the problem is, the reason you think you're the only one is because you don't know everybody else's story, too. I don't want you to misunderstand me today. I do not minimize the offense, the hurt, or the crime that has come to you. It is very real. It is very hurtful. It is very sobering. I don't minimize 
maybe what someone's done to you or said to you or how they've hurt you. They've hurt you, but if you're not careful, you'll put yourself in a prison of that hurt. Listen to me. They don't put you there. You put yourself there. And I'll be honest with you, I've been there. I'm not just preaching something that I've not had to live and experience. I've had hurts in life. Man, if you ever want to talk, I can write a book. I've had them too. So I don't minimize what you've went through. But friend, how long? How long are you going to continue to carry that on your back? How long are you going to be robbed of freedom? How long are you going to be robbed of joy? I'm not in freedom that every time I see that person, I, I just go crazy on the inside. Maybe you're kind of like, you know, others. You, you, you kind of remain calm. You can see them, and you can put on a fake smile, and you can just, I mean, you can just love them and love them, and you just, everybody thinks you're just the best of friends, and inside you are seething. Listen, you know what the only thing that's happening there? You're living in bondage. They're not. Have you ever had somebody offend you and they had no idea they offended you? Listen, let me give you, this is not the sermon, but let me give you. If they don't even know they offended you, don't go and say, you know what, you probably don't even know this, but. Don't, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. This was a legitimate, they both knew this had happened. You know it's happened. For this is a hard road to walk. It's a cancer that will eat away at you. It will take your peace. It will take your joy. It will rob you of the life. That you were created to live in Christ. So what do we do? If we know the truth. And the word says now that you know these things. Blessed are you if you do them. Next week we're going we're gonna to wrap this up next week. And we're going to talk about how to make forgiveness final next week. But for this week. You say you know what I've got this situation. Some of you, the person, the person who's created this situation with you, you can't even go back to. Some of them have died. Some of them, you may not even know where they live. You may not know anything about them. And you don't have the opportunity to go to them and, and things be mended. So what do I do? I absolutely need God's help. Listen, God is the master of forgiveness. Forgiveness was his idea in the beginning. So if there's anybody, you see, I can, I can talk to other people. You know, I can grab Ford and say, Ford, listen, I had this guy do this, and don't you think God would just go smack him really good? And Ford may go, yes, yes, in fact, that's bad enough, I'll go smack him with you. <laughs> you see, Ford, Ford is like me, he's flawed. Ford and I come from the same perspective. Forgiveness didn't originate with us. We were just the recipients of it. The person I really need to talk to is the one who ordained forgiveness, the one who's granted the most forgiveness, the one who created forgiveness to release us, and that is God the Father. I've got to give it to Him. Listen, you can't resolve it with them until you resolve it with Him. You've got to resolve it with Him first got to resolve with him first would you just bow your heads we're going to close kind of in two parts this morning Paul, you can come would you just bow your heads right now if you would say pastor there are I'm 
I've got a situation, circumstance. Maybe it's years ago. Maybe it was this morning. I don't know. But you say, Pastor, while all heads are bad, you'd say, just remember me in prayer this morning. There's an issue of forgiveness I'm battling with. Would you just lift your hand quickly right where you're at? Yes, 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 yes. How many others? You join these have already raised their hands. Please remember me in prayer. Yes, yes. Please remember me in prayer. Please remember prayer. Yes. Yes. Oh. God knows. God in His love looks down on you as those hands are lifted. He sees the situation. And He loves you. He loves you. Anyone else this morning? While we wait. Just keep your heads bowed, if you will. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for you, but I need you right where you're at. I need you to pray. And you're going to have to give this one to God. Now, listen, I know that we're in a quiet surrounding, and so you don't have to out loud voice out everything that's happened, but you can internally. You can just talk to Him. That's the wonderful thing about God. He goes beyond all the human barriers. He can hear you right where you're sitting. Say, Lord. You know that situation. And you know how bad that's hurt. And Lord, by your grace today, I release them. I release them. Lord, it hurts so bad. But I pray today with your grace and I release them. Because I know how you released me. And I want to release someone else. Would you just pray that in your own way, right where you're at while I pray over us all? Father, there's nothing about our lives that you don't see. God, and you see how bad this stuff has hurt. You've seen how discouraging it's been. God, you have seen. God, you know you know what comes back up in us, Lord, when we see that person. And you know the battles we wrestle with in our minds afterwards. God, you know the people today in this room that felt abandoned because of the hurt. They felt betrayed because of the hurt. They felt stabbed in the back because of the hurt. You know the shame that's come to some because of the hurt the embarrassment Father you know the days the years and even the decades that some have been plagued by these hurts Father right now I believe this is a moment of your grace and I believe this is a moment a divine moment I believe Lord anything is possible in you I pray in the name of Jesus for men and women who've lifted hands today. In the name of Jesus, Lord, as they're talking to you, Father, right now, I pray for release. God, they're doing the best they know to do to release that person. God, would you come in right now? Would you come in with your grace? Would you come in with your mercy? Hmm. Through your grace, we can give grace. Through your mercy, we can be merciful. Oh, God, help them. Help them, I pray. Help them, I pray. Lord, there's people that will say, it can't be done that quick. But I believe there's power in the name of Jesus. And in Jesus' name, I declare you can be free. In Jesus' name, I declare that bonds can be broken. 
I declare that weights can come off of your shoulders in the name of Jesus. I declare over your life that nothing is impossible, but all things are possible to them that believe. Father, I trust you and your word today. I'm standing on it. I'm believing you for it. That freedom is going to come. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Next Sunday, we are, Lord willing, I want to share with you on making forgiveness final. Living a life free in forgiveness. But here's how I'd like to close our time. Um, If you'd stand with me this morning. And I'd like to ask you, as you stand, would you just come out and make your way around and fill up the front of this church as close as you can come I'd like uh, to invite everyone to come and join us if, maybe if you can't stand if you want to come and sit in the first couple rows and I just want to invite you to come come and be with us just keep coming What a great group of people. How blessed we are to be here with you. Here's the reason that I ask you to to come forward this morning. Because the truth is, there's probably, there's probably nobody in Paula's life she's had to extend forgiveness to more times than she has me. You see, because we live together. And uh, sometimes I'm not always on my A game. (laughs) And um, the people that stand around you, some of them are people you live with. Some of them are people you are family with. Some of them, they're friends. And some of them, they're church people. I don't want you to lift your hands, but you ever been hurt by somebody in the church? Yeah. Yeah. I think we all have at one time or another, haven't we? Here's the problem. We're humans, and we all live on the same planet. If you move to a planet by yourself, nobody will be there to hurt you. But I'm assuming you're going to stay here with all of us. (laughs) And so there's potential somebody in the future is going to hurt you. It may be the person standing next to you. I don't know. But it will happen. One of the things that we find about God is this. It's it's what we found in the story. The master had pity on him and forgave him the debt and said, you can go home. You don't have to come back. We don't have to have a discussion on this again. You're free. Go. And that's what we find in God. God is quick to forgive. Man, he's so quick to forgive. We say the words... Please forgive me. And immediately the word comes back forgiven. Oh, God, help us to be quick to forgive. Help us to be quick to forgive. Help us to be quick to forgive. I'd like to pray twofold. Number one, I'd like for us to pray, Lord, help me to be a person that's quick to forgive. Help me to release my pride off the table. My ego off the table. What I deserve off the table. Help me to be quick to forgive. Can you pray that prayer with me? Then we're going to pray a different direction. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, help me. Help Jerry to be quick to forgive. Help me, Lord, not to harbor. Uh, Help me, Lord, not to hold grudges. Help me to be quick to forgive, to release, to resolve. Help me not to continue to carry Uh, junk around but Lord help me to be quick to release others be quick to forgive and totally to release them totally release them Father my ego is not on the table my pride is not on the table my me and all of my feelings not on the table 
Help me to be quick. Help me to be like you. Because Jesus, I'm most like you when I'm forgiving. So help me to forgive like you forgive. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now would you take your neighbor by the hand? You may not know them. That's all right. <laughs> As you take your neighbor by the hand, here's what I want us to do. This world is so full of ill-spoken words. I'd like for you to pray blessing over the people on both sides of you. If you know their name, that's fine. You can say, Lord, bless uh, Ford, whoever's sitting next to you. If you don't know their name, you can say, Lord, bless my brother, bless my sister. And you're in the church. You're safe that way. <laughs> and just listen, listen. All the good things you can think of to bless them with, bless it. Speak bless. It's never a blessing until you speak it out. So speak those things over the people. I'm standing next to Paula, so I'm going to speak blessing over Paula while y'all speak blessing over each other, okay? Father, in Jesus' name, I just pray, Lord, your best blessings on her. I pray, God, for new strength in her body. I pray, God, you renew her strength in you. Father, I pray the spirit of creativity to flow out of her as she's never experienced it before. I pray, God, you'll pour things into her that you can pour back out of her. God, like she's never imagined. Lord, I pray, God, you'll give her greater desire, Father, for you and the things of the kingdom. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, you give her the desires of her heart. Lord, your word says that you give us the desires of our heart, and I pray, God, you'll do that. I pray you'll withhold no good thing from her life. I pray you'll continue to work all things together for her good. Lord, I pray you'll bless her as she gets up, and bless her as she sits down. I pray you'll bless her in everything she puts her hand to. I pray for great health in the name of Jesus. I speak health over her body. I speak creativity. I speak peace in the name of Jesus over her life. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, no good thing will you withhold from her. And, Father, this morning, I speak your blessing over these people. Lord, I pray, God, that you'll cause your face to shine upon them every day. I pray, Father, they'll walk in your favor every day of their life. I pray, God, they'll never be in a place where they don't have what they need because you are the supplier of all we need. Lord, I believe this. Your word says you've given us every good thing we need to live a godly life in this world. Lord, I pray all those things in abundance over them today. All those things in abundance. Pressed down, shaken together running over in their life. God, I pray you'll bless them with your mercy. Bless them with your kindness. Bless them with your grace. God, would you just lavish on them some fresh love today? And I pray, God, you'll do great things in them this week. I pray this week for great strength in their bodies, strength in their minds, strength in their spirits. God, I pray this will be a great week of growing in you. I pray, Father, I pray you'll give them a, a fresh hunger for your word this week. I pray a fresh desire for prayer this week. And fresh desire to walk in communion with the Holy Spirit this week. God, I pray all these things over them. I speak the word, Father, over their lives. And I believe, Lord, that when we speak it, it comes into being. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that every one of these things would be fulfilled in abundance in their life. And Father, I trust you for it. I'm believing you for it. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said, Amen. 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 We love you all. Amen. Is the Lord good? Amen. He's so good. He's so good. He's so good to us. Amen. May the joy of the Lord be your strength this week. May you walk in his abundant grace. God bless you all. Have a great day in Jesus. God bless.